Hi, good afternoon. My name is uh, Ray Cromwell, and this is Phil Rogers, and we're members of the Google Web Toolkit team. And today our session is called Kick-Ass Game Programming with Google Web Toolkit. Now you might be saying, what does kick-ass game programming mean? So we think it means two things. The first is that the kind of games that you'll be able to produce using some of the tools we're going to show you today are not kind of like HTML5 toys or prototypes or kind of like hobby curiosities, but they'll be real games that um, will be fun to play and that people will be willing to pay for. And the second thing is, is that by using some of the tools, you'll get such a boost in productivity that you'll feel that just the programming itself kicks ass. So if you remember from last year, um, we, show, we showed the Quake 2 port to HTML5 called GwitQuake, and that was done with GWT also. And um, I thought that was a pretty kick-ass demo. But a lot of people came to me and said, you know, could you show me something more recent than 1997? So um, this year we were happy to oblige, and in partnership with Rovio, who did an incredible job on short notice using these tools, um, we're happy to show you Angry Birds, which you might have saw in the keynote. And I'll tell you some things about it as Phil's playing it. So one of the things, of course, is that it runs incredibly smoothly at 60 frames per second using uh, WebGL or whatever technology your browser has to do the rendering. And so as we were building this, one of the concerns we had was the physics performance. So you know, Angry Birds is a computationally intensive game. When you smash down the level, the, um, your engine basically has to calculate where each and every one of the pieces has to land in terms of their interactions and their collisions. And that's very intensive. So we were wondering, was JavaScript fast enough to run it? And thankfully, the answer is yes. So with Chrome 11, V8 is just so incredibly fast that the physics layer runs buttery smooth. But three things I want to say about the actual implementation, don't get carried away, Phil. <laughs> three things I want to say about the implementation are is that one, uh, it was built with GWT. Two, it was built with purely with HTML5 technology. And three, it was built with a new library for GWT that allows you to write games that we're going to present to you today. So um, if you know Phil can manage to stop playing, and uh, all right, I'll tell you what, I'll let you shoot one more bird. All right. <laughs> All right. Oh, I got it. So the question you, some of people might have is, why GWT? What is GWT going to do for you? So if you're a seasoned GWT developer, you already know that GWT is pretty awesome for developing enterprise apps. But you know, games, you know, does enterprise have anything to do with games? Well, if you are a beginner JavaScript pro, um, GWT programmer or JavaScript JavaScript programmer, you might be saying, I already know how to write JavaScript. I already know HTML5 and CSS and Canvas. Why would I write my game in GWT when I could just do it by hand? What, where's the benefit? And I'm not going to say, actually, you should use GWT. Um, if you are most comfortable in JavaScript or your team is most comfortable in JavaScript and HTML5, that's a very viable strategy and it's a very good way to write a game. And as many of the presentations that Google I.O. has shown you, including Seth's awesome Super Browser Turbo Mix HD showed you yesterday, you can build a game very fast in HTML5 and JavaScript. But hopefully we can show you a few additional things that GWT can provide that might persuade you to just try it out because um, it's going to boost um, some of your capabilities. So let's take a look at some of those. First, um, it lets you leverage a familiar Java tool chain. So if you're a Java programmer already, and you like Java IDEs, you like Eclipse or IntelliJ, you like your debug environment, you like your build system, you like your testing framework, um, you're going to get all of that. Plus, you can leverage a lot of libraries that are already out there in the ecosystem, like physics libraries, AI libraries, image processing libraries, and so on, without having to do much work. So you sort of get to leverage stuff, work that people have already done. The second thing is, is that you can share code between the client and the server. So let's say you've got a game, and you want to put anti-cheat mechanisms in it. So you're posting high scores back to the server, and you don't want people to just like do their own HTTP or XHR post to your server and say, I got a million points. So how would you verify that? So one of the things you can do is you can take your game logic, like um, your physics and your AI, and since it's written in Java, you could run them on the server, like an app engine, so that when you post a high score, you can send over a couple bits of data, like what the user actions were and what the random number generator sees were, and replay the game in the server and engine environment and validate that actually what they were saying is true. And that's actually, um, we've actually done some work on that, and it works pretty well. So you get the leverage 
code between platforms, including, say, Android. So you might have written some code where, for your game on HTML5, but since it's written in Java, you could reuse those same classes for an Android game. So that's another th benefit you get. And then you also get, of course, small, fast JavaScript. So let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> so as an example of leveraging familiar tools, you might be familiar with Box2D. It was originally a C++ library to emulate rigid body 2D physics. And I don't know what the actual statistics are, but probably 90% of all the top games in the iPhone store are written using Box2D, including like Angry Birds. So it's very, very popular for doing game engines. Um, now, some guys actually went out and they ported it to Java, and it's called JBox2D. And that's been around for a while, but I don't know very many people who are using it. And that actually helped us out a lot because a couple of guys at Google saw that library, and in just 30 minutes, they were able to port it and optimize it to run efficiently in V8 inside the browser with GWT. So that demonstrates the ability to leverage the existing ecosystem very effectively with GWT, and also to leverage um, code sharing, because it was originally written in Java for a whole other platform, and we were able to repurpose it. So just to sort of um, say a few things about the GWT compiler, which actually I happen to work on. Um, it basically is not just a Java to JavaScript translator. It's an optimizing compiler like a regular C compiler. And what it does is it does things like removing unused code. It evaluates things at compile time that it doesn't need to do at runtime. It inlines functions, and it heavily obfuscates to result. So um, one aspect of that is that smaller code tends to load faster. So the smaller the code that's compiled, the faster it's, your game's going to load up. Secondly, when it compiles the code, it computes a hash of the code, and it names the output file according to that hash. Now, that's very important because it allows us to do something called perfect caching. So when the user accesses your game, it, the file name is related to the actual bytes of the original source code. And that, your browser is told to cache that forever. So the next time you come to play the game, even if you're offline or online, it doesn't even go to the web server at all. They even check if it's been updated or changed. It basically says, oh, I'm just going to load that up. It's cached forever right out of my cache. Now, if you do happen to change the game, you, what happens is, is you get a new file on the server. It has a different file name. And there's a very small GWT bootstrap script that checks um, that, that is downloaded and basically points you at the new, redirects you to the new file. But that's only going to be downloaded once. So you only download when things change. You don't actually even have to go to the server to revalidate. Last but not least, inlining the code actually helps the compiler make it smaller, believe it or not. But for every function call you eliminate, that's excess overhead in your runtime that V8 engine doesn't have to worry about trying to optimize. So inlining also speeds things up. So you get smaller code and faster code. So let's talk a little bit about HTML5. Because HTML5, when people use the term, it actually tends to mean two different things. So there's the HTML5 spec that's in the standards committees, which is the formal HTML5 spec. And that includes things like you know, Canvas and audio tags and video tags and the app cache. But it doesn't include things like WebGL or, um, say, the new Web Audio API. But you know, when you go look around in the Twitter sphere or the blogosphere and people say HTML5, what they really mean is colloquial HTML5. They mean what's in the latest sort of tip of the source repositories of the browsers out there, the latest things they've added, because HTML5 is a continuously evolving spec. And so that's what we're kind of targeting. And so throughout the rest of the presentation, when we talk about HTML5, that's what we're talking about. But so what does HTML5 do for games? So WebGL is big. Any browser that has WebGL will, able, will be able to really, really accelerate graphics op, um, operations directly to the hardware. You won't have much of JavaScript or the operating system getting in the way. If you don't happen to have that, um, CSS3 is usually hardware accelerated on many platforms, including mobile platforms. So that actually is a, a big help as well. And we're going to show you in some demos later how we leverage those things. So next slide. So let's talk a little bit about the game, overview of a game uh, architecture before we move on. So typically, you need three things when you're programming a game. First, your game needs to be able to communicate with the outside world. And that means you need to be able to get input from the user, like he pulls the trigger to fire, or you get a packet over the network because some other person pulled the trigger and he's firing at you. And you need to output. So you need to be able to um, display those changes back to the user. And you need to be able to play sounds. And you need to be able to send packets back to other people who you're connected to. So you basically need an I.O. system. Secondly, although programming the, the, the code for the game takes up a lot of effort, 
for most really polished games, the art assets actually are the most important thing. So dealing, like for example, you know, probably Angry Birds or, or another game like that, the assets probably make up a factor of 10 times or bigger than the actual code. So being able to load those assets efficiently and cache them offline um, and load them in the right order so you can get the person playing as soon as possible is very important. So asset management is important. And then third is the game loop. So most games have like an internal clock that's usually key to the um, frame rate or the vertical sync period. And what happens is that every tick of that clock, three things happen. One is we process all input that, from the user. So maybe you know, he sh the user pressed the mouse button or he, you know, he, he touched the tablet. Maybe you got a packet from the network because somebody chatted with you. So you need to take those inputs and then feed them into the next stage, which is to update the state of the world based on those inputs. And that usually t um, takes into account things like running physics simulations, running AI, um, running game logic, like updating the scoreboard because someone got a kill, things like that. And then finally, after you've updated the state of the world, you need to communicate the state of the world back to the user. And that means rendering graphics, that means rendering um, audio, and sending packets back out to other players. So that's basically very briefly the, the three important things that make up a game engine. So let's discuss some of the challenges. So when you're developing for multiple browsers or for multiple platforms, it's very difficult to get optimal versions of these components on various platforms. Uh, to give you an example, let's say you're, you're doing Canvas work. Now Canvas, the Canvas API on some browsers is accelerated really well. For example, IE9, believe it or not, does an amazing job with Canvas. And as you've seen, uh, Chrome 11 and Chrome 12 and later versions actually is doing really well with it now too, but other browsers not so much. So the problem is that if you program directly to Canvas, you never know which particular draw call you're making is going to be the accelerated path or which is going to be the slow path. So that's sort of a minefield that you don't want to basically get into. You want someone to absolve you of that responsibility. Then on other browsers, you have WebGL. And WebGL is pretty much always guaranteed to be fast. However, some browsers don't have WebGL. So if you wrote your game purely to WebGL, you might kind of be stuck. And last but not least, you know, maybe you're using CSS3 um, to do all your sprite graphics. And they're not accelerated on a particular platform. So that's basically one of the big challenges. Likewise, asset management. So each and every platform has a different, unfortunately, a different way of dealing with offline assets right now. So some browsers implement you know, app cache, they have local storage, they have IndexedDB, DOM storage. If you're on Android, you have a different storage mechanism. If you're using Flash, you've got a different way of controlling assets. So managing assets, loading them over the network, and caching them locally is, is typically a challenge. And then last but not least, the game loop. So you might have seen in several presentations here that traditionally, like if you're a JavaScript programmer, you think in terms of using timers to, to kick off your rendering loop. But that's pretty bad because when you use like set timeout in JavaScript, the browser doesn't really know what you're doing. So you could be rendering, but you could be doing something else. And that's unfortunate because if you're in a different tab uh, or, the, or the window is minimized, the browser is just going to keep firing that timer and doing tons of work. And it's going to chew your battery life and it's going to heat up your machine. So different platforms have different ways of syncing with the vertical blanking period or the redraw period of the, of the platform. So in the newer versions of browsers, you have this request animation frame in colloquial HTML5. That sort of takes care of that for you. But if you're deploying to like Flash, it's different. And if you're deploying to like Android, it's different. So that's basically another challenge is basically syncing, syncing video and timing events on different platforms. So basically, I'm going to hand it over to Phil right now. And he's actually going to describe how we solve some of those problems with GWT and a new library we're introducing. Cool. Thanks. So uh, to answer these questions, the abstraction is key. Um, you may remember that GWT abstracts away the differences between browsers, such as Firefox 4 or IE9. We can apply that same logic to games, uh, abstracting away not only the browser differences, but the differences between platforms as well. So the Java platform, or Android as a platform, or the browser as a platform. So to do that, we wrote a library called ForPlay. ForPlay is an abstraction layer for games written in Java, but it's GWT compatible. So you get all the benefits of your Java development environment, but you can also compile it down to fast and efficient JavaScript. And this is all free and open source. It's a very alpha version at the moment. But as you can see, we wrote a kick-ass game with it, and we hope you guys will too. So the source is available here, as well as samples for everything we're going to show from here on out. 
So you might be thinking service provider interface in Java, and that's, that is what, what this is. Basically, you write to a core game API called for play, and we swap in the implementation for each platform. For instance, if you're running on Java, we'll swap in the Java platform. If you're on GWT, we'll swap in that platform. Android, and maybe even Flash, we'll show you later. So let me start with a demo, always fun, and then we'll actually dive into the game and such. So this is a game. It's running in the browser, as you can see. We're actually using WebGL here. This is written using foreplay, and you can see this is a simple sprite-based game. I click the mouse, we have physics, we're using the Box CD physics engine here, and you can see it's a, it's a fairly simple game. We click our things, they bounce, we have different, say, physics properties on, say, this blue thing versus the, the box. We even have some fun stuff in here. <laughs> and, and what's really cool about this is look at how uh, performance it is. So this is like in the browser and we're running lots and lots of physics and like there's not really a, a problem here. So that's just kind of cool, actually. Let's see how far it'll go. Oh, they're all crowding in the portal now. And now you can see the hacks that I did to make this all work. Oh, there we go. We got the infinite loop going. So, okay. so the components of foreplay. Uh, we have these are the three main components we just talked about for games, abstracting out the game layers. We have the game loop, the I/O system, and asset management. For play it provides the abstractions for you and swaps in the appropriate uh, code for each platform. So for instance, on the browser, we'll use request animation framework available for your I.O. loop, whereas, say, on the desktop environment, we might sync to vSync or something like that. And uh, so you can see here in, in the game update loop, we have init. So you write the game to the core of foreplay game layer, and you automatically get calls to init, update, and paint. And so this is actually for, uh, for instance, you might want to run your physics update at 30 FPS, but you might want to draw at 60 FPS. We actually even provide, you can see a float delta on the paint line. And what that's for is so that you can, say, interpolate. So you're drawing much faster than you're updating, and you want to interpolate to make it really, like, really smooth. Uh, for your I.O. system, we have tons of stuff here. Uh, fast graphics for 2D sprite-based graphics. We have audio, we have nets, we have keyboard input, output, touch input and output. Um, and all this is kind of abstracted in a really easy to use way, and I'll show you that a little bit later. Last, we have asset management. Uh, the web is asynchronous. There's a whole bunch of issues there. We provide this ways to get your sound, your input, your text, including JSON, uh, as well as callbacks for when these things happen, so you can make, say, a loading screen or something like that. And for play provides the, the magic that happens to swap in the correct platform that you're running on. So you really write to one API, and you get, you write very little, actually one line of code or one, maybe five lines of code per platform, and you get swapped in the correct one. I'll show you a little bit later. So this is, this is kind of the beginning of a game. This is a, my game, we'll call it, and this is how you would write to the foreplay API. We simply implement the game interface, and we have init, update, and paint. And like I said before, these just get called for you once you start your game. Let me go to the next slide and show you the interpolation code. So again, you're, say, drawing at 60 FPS, but you're only running at 30 on your physics update loop. And this is where, this is how you could, for instance, interpolate in a 2D game. And you can see here, we have interpolation code. It's fairly trivial. And it is usually where you load your resources. And the update loop is usually where you'd process the I.O. and basically update your physics layer or run your AI. And then the pane is basically where you redisplay everything. Oh, yes, that's right. Actually, we'll show you in more detail. Actually, uh, I can show you the source of the P physics game. So um, input devices. This is kind of the, the basics of how you would start writing your game. This is the same my game, implementing game, but now we've added pointer and keyboard. And you can see we automatically get callbacks into on, pain, on pointer move or on pointer scroll or on key down. And foreplay handles the fact that you're kind of running asynchronous code sometimes on some platforms. So you're not going to get these callbacks in while you're doing your physics update loop or in your paint loop. It's all going to be spliced correctly. Now, really, the, the, the real meat of foreplay is handling of the image system. So there's three graphics primitives foreplay provides. We have image, surface, and canvas. Image is your fast path, simple drawing of images. And this allows you to get stuff on the screen, rotate, scale, and translate it. Surface takes image and takes a little bit further. What Surface really provides is the fast pass of OpenGL or WebGL. What it provides is things like FillRect or also draw image. It can draw multiple images and have them cached on a single surface. 
Canvas is the superset of, of both of the previous two and even more. It actually provides what the HTML5 Canvas provides. We've abstracted away the, the different things on different platforms. So you could do things like text, like strokes, and really it comes at a cost because these things, you, you don't want to be updating a Canvas at 60 FPS. So what we do is we let you cache the Canvas result onto a surface and then draw the surface fast. And this whole system is done inside a layer, layer system, really similar to Flash. So it allows you to put a whole bunch of canvases or surfaces or images into the different layers and move them around separately. I'll show you that in more detail. So this is the P physics sample we saw before. Uh, we have three group layers in this case. In the first group layer, we have a whole bunch of image layers inside of it. And this is where all our Ps are being drawn and they're being moved around, this is all dynamic. On the next layer, this should really be implemented as a surface layer. So on the initial init, what we would do is we would draw a whole bunch of our blocks, the static blocks, we'd have them cached there. Then we'd just redraw this cached image each time. So that's gonna be really fast. Lastly, we have just a simple image behind the whole thing. That's just being drawn by itself. So this is the asset management. You'd really wanna do this in your init cycle, like Ray was saying. And what you're doing is, this is the simple example of how to load an image. So you simply say image, you ask the asset manager for it. And if you want, you can get a callback as well when this is done loading. And so this is kind of the simple way to do it. You can also have like a loading screen. For instance, Rovio did this with Angry Birds. And what, what we're doing here is we're adding images to our asset watcher and we get a callback once they've all loaded. So this is really great for, for kind of Rovio's kind of situation. Now the cross-platform magic. So you know, all, what I've said so far, everything you're writing to is platform agnostic. You don't know what platform you're running on. But this is where the magic happens. This is those few lines I said you had to write that were platform specific. We have up here HTML and Java. One of these compile, compiles down into a JavaScript slash HTML5 game. The other one compiles down to a, a desktop app. And you can see how similar the two are. You're simply starting the game and the foreplay magic is getting swapped in behind you. So to wrap up a little bit, for play is open source, it's free. You write to a core platform uh, agnostic API and you get swapped in the correct code uh, to really give you performance. Um, it's written in Java so you get, your familiar desktop, you get your familiar debugging environment. I'm gonna show you some really cool stuff with that in just a second. And um, it compiles down to HTML5 so you get a really fast, fast game as well. So let me dive down into the actual details of writing a game and show you some neat stuff about that. So this, we're gonna be using the P sample. Remember that this is, uh, this is available online so you can actually dive down into the source a little bit more. But what I'd like to show you is how great it is to debug and for play. So up here I have, this, is, this seems very similar to what we showed just a few slides ago. What this is is the, this is the game entry point essentially and we have P physics game implements game and a listener for a pointer. And as I scroll down, you can see this is the initialization cycle. Now I don't expect you to actually read this, but the idea is we just have uh, a game, we have some init, and we don't know what platform we're running on in this case. Let me go down a little bit further to this group. What we're looking at here is the on pointer start callback. This is gonna get called every time you click on the game. Oh. Embarrassing. <laughs> there. Um, sorry about that, guys. This so, is what gets run when you click the add P's, when he was dropping P's, so that's the line of code. Exactly, and what we're doing is we create a new P when that happens, and we add it to the world. And, and world is a, is a group layer that holds multiple image exactly. layers, which are the P's. Exactly. So let me actually dive down into, into what a P is. A P is a simple sprite-based thing. You might see something similar in, say, Angry Birds or any other 2D sprite game. But what I'd really like to show you is some of the cool things we can do in the debugging environment. Remember that we're writing in Java, so this stuff is really easy. Now watch this, I'm actually gonna run my game. We saw it before running as a HTML5 app. Now let's see it here running as a Java desktop app. You can see it's the same game we were talking about before. Nothing has changed. Well, let me go over here and let's say, um, let's say my boss comes in and wants, wants me to change some physics parameters. Or, you know, Chrome is really big. Let's say we want to use the Chrome image instead of the P image. Let me just go in here. 
and change the radius of the little peas that we were drawing. Or let me use a different image. Instead of the P image, we're going to use something else. Now remember that I haven't actually restarted the game. It's still running here. But now we have Chrome balls. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. But just to emphasize that, so you think about when you normally develop and you have an edit, compile, and run cycle. And even today with JavaScript and normal web programming, you have an edit refresh cycle. You edit the JavaScript, you hit refresh in the browser. Or with GWT dev mode, you, hit, you edit the Java code and you hit refresh. How about just edit? You edit, and as fast as you can tab over to the window, it's already been updated. I think, that, I think that's kick ass. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so, and also because we're running in our familiar environment of Eclipse, a lot of you guys know this, this is the standard GWT world. Uh, we have our push to app engine button at the very top, and we can just push this and push our game to app engine. Uh, well, he's not going to do that today because of the yeah. Wi Fi. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, because we can push to app engine so easy, how about pushing this to the Chrome Web Store? This is like three steps. It is so easy. You push, you've already pushed your game to an app engine. You have it hosted in the cloud. It's, it's awesome. You now visit appmater.com. You upload your URL. You download a zip file. You then go to the Chrome Web Store and upload that same zip file. And then third is profit. <laughs> you, <laughs> unlike the meme, I mean, this is the real deal. You can either sell your game. You can put ads on it. It's really easy to do. Or you can do in-game payments, and we only take 5%. I know. This is so awesome. <laughs> If they would have told us that before the presentation, we could have worked it in. So I'll hand it over to Ray. Oh, thanks, Phil. So Phil actually showed you the game running as Java and running in HTML. So we've kind of danced around the fact that we can also run the game on other platforms. And so one of the things you might be saying is, well, maybe I don't want to target the Chrome Web Store. I'm not really sure if I'm going to target you know, 170 million Chrome users or 100 million Android users. I'll figure that out later. Uh, on when I finish the game. You might want to defer your judgment and target Android. Well, you can do that because, because it's written in Java, you can take the exact same game and, and just with a few lines of code, recompile it, deploy it to any Android device, and it should work out of the box. So um, if things go OK, I'm going to show you a demo. So I didn't get uh, time to prepare a way to show it to you on the big screen, but I'll just really quickly just show you. You'll see something moving on the screen. So this is the <laughs> peas demo. I'll give the guy maybe time to zoom in, but I can drop peas. You see it runs fast. Real time, I can drop like hundreds of peas. So. It runs very fast on Android, so it, that's, that's pretty cool. So, but what about, well, I'll get to that in a second. Let me just show you what you have to do to make it run on Android. So you create your game entry point. And rather than saying Java platform.register or HTML platform.register, you say Android platform.register. We swap in the fastest native paths to Android, and your game basically runs. You just recompile packages as an APA, put it in the Android market, and profit. <laughs> Thank you. But for some of you, that still might not be enough. So. You might happen to have some poor slobs coming to you with IE6 who haven't upgraded to the latest HTML5 browser. But you know they have Flash probably. So wouldn't it be nice if you could take the game and actually run it in Flash? And it turns out you can do that. So what I'm announcing today is a new back end to the GWT compiler. It's an add-on that basically compiles Java to ActionScript 3 and builds a Flash application. And so here is an example of, well, first let me just show you a demo before I get to the example, the P's Flash game. So here's, here's a version of it. This is actually a different version because of the Wi-Fi. I couldn't actually get the most recent version on here. So it doesn't have the portal, for example, and it's, some of the physics constants are different. But I'll show you by right-clicking here that it's Flash. So. so how do you have, what do you have to do to get it to compile to Flash? You have to do one thing. You say flash platform two things actually, flash platform register, and you have to make a GWT module file that inherits from um, the ActionScript compiler.gwt.xml file. That's all you have to do. 
So let me just talk a little bit about the Gwt to Flex com compiler. So it's not a fork of the Gwt compiler. It's actually an add-on. So you just drop a jar file into any of your normal Gwt projects, and you inherit from a module, and this thing kicks in. And what does it do? Well, basically, it does a couple of things. First, because JavaScript is similar to ActionScript, it basically has a couple of extra passes that emits um, safe ActionScript on the back end so that this Flex compiler can compile it. Secondly, I've wrapped um, a lot of the Flash.Display, MIDI, and other APIs that are part of the Flex SDK with overlay types in GWT. So you can just call directly into the native Flash platform if you want to, just from Java code, like create a sprite and add it somewhere. So you don't have to use foreplay. Actually, you can just write a, a, a Flash-only app if you want, your Flex app. And then third, it has a specialized set of linkers on the back end that package up ActionScript resources and run the Flash compiler. And later on, actually, they are used SWF mill to do asset packaging. So it will package your, your other images and artworks directly into the SWF file um, for you. So let's wrap up. Um, why GWT? Performance, ease of writing code, and portability. Um, I've showed you the core components of architecting a game, the I.O. system, the asset management, and the event loop. And we've shown that by using an abstract platform that's not really GWT specific or Android specific, you can write a game that can target multiple, including Flash. Um, and the last thing I'd like to say is um, go build a game. So download this library. It's in an alpha state. Documentation is kind of poor right now, and we apologize. We've been spending more time preparing for presentation and documenting. but. We're going to be working on it over the next couple of days, but take a look at it and have fun. And um, we have a lot of time to answer questions because we anticipated there will be some. So it's question time. Thank you. Hi. Um, so is there like the equivalent of JSNI for the Flash backend? <laughs> So can we write native action script to interface between the Java world and the action would, would that world? Would that be ASNI action <laughs> <laughs> script? Sorry. So um, yes, and, and in fact, that's how the foreplay library is written. So there is a whole bunch of Disney classes that are already there for you to access like flash.display, flash.events, flash.net, um, flash.media. So I've covered sort of the minimal set of Flash APIs already that you'd want to call into for the game. But if you download the source code, you're welcome to actually write your own Disney right, classes. Your own. And, and is the source for that available as well for that back end? Is that out on the same website? Yes. Uh, they actually parallel. And it's, real, it's, it's really easy to find. You'll just see a source directory, and it'll be like flash slash net, flash slash display. So they exactly parallel the uh, Flash APIs. Cool, great. Thanks. By the way, I think I might not have checked in the jar file for the Flash compiler yet. <laughs> so if, don't be disappointed. After the session, I'll go make sure the website has everything. Uh, go ahead. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you've abstracted the I.O. for the uh, uh, drawings and the con uh, control input, but what about stuff like for networking, for multiplayer? Uh, good question. So actually, we have a um, foreplay.net class that abstracts the network as well as, so it doesn't do web sockets yet, but it ex ex abstracts asynchronous push-pull response requests. And it even extracts um, abstracts JSON across multiple platforms. So you can fetch, for example, the level data to load um, uh, the P's level is as a JSON file, and there's a parser on Android, there's one on Flash, and there's one on HTML5 and Java. Yeah, to take that a step further, the, this cross-platform JSON parser is really useful, for instance, for sprite sheets. And I think that Rovio used that for Angry Birds. Uh, you essentially have one single image, and you have different little sprite sheets on it, and Foreplay is really good at that stuff. Does this use uh, 2.3 or does it require 2.4 beta? It uses 2.3, th well, I built it with 2.3.3, um, so it should, should work on there, but um, I haven't tested on 3.0 yet. Hopefully it works there. <laughs> okay. 2.4. <laughs> oh, you were asking about GWT. Uh, I thought you were talking about Android. Uh, yeah, no, it, it works on 2.3. It works on 2.3. The two answer three. is yes. It just so happens that I have 2.3 on my phone. <laughs> so, hi. Um, how's the performance compared uh, from the HTML version versus the Java or Android version? And have you tested on other branded uh, mobile operating systems? Uh, good question. So the performance for desktop Java, for Android, 
and for HTML5 browsers, at least the ones that we all like, <laughs> uh, is actually very good, as you saw with Angry Birds. The performance in Flash of executing uh, the, the code in Flash is not quite as good as V8. Um, so the Flash VM is not quite as good as V8, but it's also because the code that I'm generating now, the GWT compiler, is not optimal yet for Flash. So uh, I generate typeless ActionScript 3, and so I'm not giving the Flash VM uh, the, op the opportunity to do more optimization. So uh, later revisions of the Flash compiler will probably produce more optimal code. But it, in my testing, it actually runs well enough to do a game on Flash as well. So, so to answer your question about mobile platforms, I don't know if we can give numbers, but I will say we have loaded up uh, some of the games we've done, in, including Angry Birds, on uh, an iPad 2, and the frame rate was way above my expectations. I wouldn't say that people would be happy about it compared to the native version, but what it gives, says is that if they make the browser slightly faster on the mobile devices, or if Moore's Law kicks in and the iPad 3 is like twice as fast, you might be able to get 60 frames per second with an HTML5 game on those devices. Yeah, you kind of just answered my question about the flash player uh, speed. I wonder if you could elaborate that on any, you know, any more sort of what things you might plan for that or if that was just an example. Or yeah, so um, there are a couple of things that we're not doing that we could do. So one is we don't, we don't generate um, um, types. So we could generate ActionScript 3 classes for each Java class and generate methods instead of functions. So basically we're using the existing GWT backend with modifications. So a lot of things just become JavaScript functions instead of ActionScript methods. So that compiles fine and it works, but it probably does not run optimally in the Flash VM. But um, I'm, that's the next step. That's, so the next to do for me is to make the compiler generate much more optimal ActionScript 3 code. How about size-wise? How about size-wise? Does it make a fairly large SWIFT, or do you have uh, any way of making modules or uh, RSLs it, or anything? So like it, that? it actually makes pr it makes actually a pretty small SWIFT. I believe the P's game was about 58K, and there's some packaged resources in there, but it, it, could, it could be better. Um, Quit, you know, has code splitting capability, and um, we could use that to leverage by splitting an application across multiple SWIFTs and loading them in on demand, but we haven't investigated that yet. That's a good question. Go ahead. So I apologize if this has been covered already, but uh, so does the Foreplay API cover audio at, at all? Yes, That's a it good has. Point. Go yeah, ahead. okay. So. Uh, yes, it had, but it covers very primitive audio, because when we started, uh, we knew we had to target basically what was enabled in Chrome 11, which is the regular audio tag, which is basically just based on streaming basic audio. Um, so basically, yes, on Flash, it will use the Flash Sound APIs to play the audio. On HTML5, it will use the audio tag, or it will use a, a Sound Manager 2 Flash library to do it. Or on Android, it will use a native Sound API. So Sound is supported, but it's very, it's very basic. You can play. Um, AUG or MP3 or WAV files on Q, but you can't do much manipulation. But that, that will change. Great. Thank you. Yep. Kind of wondering what your support is for binary data over the wire when it comes to AMF, if you're sending it to BlazeDS or protocol buffers or something else. You talked about JSON, but I don't know if you had any right. experience dealing with mapping ActionScript objects to POJOs and code generating that in JSON. Yeah, so we haven't added any support yet because we kind of want we took a least common denominator support for that. So you can fetch known binary assets like um, MIDI assets, right, as binary. And that works because it basically translates directly to the flash um, loader API or URL loader. But um, if you just want to load up an arbitrary binary file, we don't really support that because it, until very recently, it was slow in HTML5 to load large bi scale binary objects. But that's changing now. There's the typed array spec, and there's, there's a couple of other APIs for doing it. So that will probably be added later. Thank you. Hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> it's actually, I have a this guy. Yeah. I have a question. <laughs> so actually, like, how do you guys simulate the event loop in, in JavaScript on the web platform? Because it's just, I don't know, do you, do you use timeouts? I, I'm just curious. OK, so for the browser, if your browser supports request animation frame, we use that. And what happens is the browser will when it's drawing, so if you're actually focused the tab and it's on the screen it's visible, when it's drawing 60 times a second, it will call you, basically, so on a schedule. Uh, if your browser doesn't have it, then we'll fall back to set timeout or set interval. Um, obviously not as efficient. So it's, we basically take as an efficient as path as we can. And on Android, of course, we use multiple threads and looper um, and handler objects to basically you know, have everything run in one thread and then we post messages to it with events. And what this means is for something like P's, your physics actually runs in the background using set timeouts. 
but your, fi your, yeah. your drawing, your paint update loop doesn't run yeah. at all. Actually, it's interesting on Android because Android supports multiple threads unlike the browser. Um, you actually get a little bit of a boost because you can run the physics and stuff in the background and you can run the, the paint loop in a different thread, which is pretty cool. Thanks. This. Is this is the new Flash backend going to become a part of GWT, or is it going to is it going to just be part of Foreplay? Is it going to be like a, can, will it be supported for non game use? I guess. In the uh, of things? So uh, this is not an official Google project. This is kind of like the personal pet project of a bunch of people who have like an itch to scratch. But uh, so it will be part of Foreplay, and um, uh, going forward, um, we will be supporting it because we're going to be using it for multiple things. So you don't need to use it by ga for games actually. So if you wanted to build a traditional enterprise flex app, but you wanted to use Java to do it and Eclipse, you could actually use the, the Flash compiler to do it because we expose most of the Flex APIs and it's easy to expose more with regular GWT Disney methods. And you could, you could theoretically build a Flex, a Flex ML you know, a, application. But you don't <laughs> intend to fold it back into mainline GWT. It's going to remain a separate project. I don't, I don't think Google would support something called foreplay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I meant more the, the Flash backend. That's not going to that's not going to find its way back into mainline GWT. No, this is actually one of the first times because uh, the, the compiler does have sort of hooks for attaching other backends, and this is sort of the first real ever like add-on backend that's been made public. And there are other ones in the pipeline, so uh, it's possible like there might be a separate website, like an incubator, where we drop these things in the future. Thanks. Hi, I was wondering if you could clarify how foreplay development compares to or you know, interacts with sort of normal GWT development. So you know, would it be possible to sort of build your game Chrome, you know, your menus and your launch screens and everything in sort of normal GWT and then have sort of play area be in foreplay? Or is it really expected to be an entirely foreplay canvas based thing? Sure, I can kind of answer this. It's kind of twofold. One is foreplay allows you to call out into the browser if you want to. So in this, with this mechanism, um, you can definitely write it in the standard GWT way. But the core of foreplay, like <coughs> writing, writing a game to, that, to the foreplay game layer, is you're really writing in pure Java. And GWT is kind of a side issue. Um, so yes. Foreplay development is actually not really GWT development. But I, there's a yeah. caveat to that. You can actually mash it up with any arbitrary GWT app. So for example, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but Angry Birds actually, like the, the, some of the buttons yeah. <laughs> surrounding it, like the switching between HD and SD versions, there are other things around the actual game that are actually done as you would normally expect in a GWT app. OK, and then when you <coughs> talk about cross-platform support, and that, but that applies really to just the um, sort of game area part of the game, the foreplay part on the game is what, and so you yes, redo I'm, your Chrome on each platform. That's right. In theory, somebody could create like a widget library to abstract like a, a, a list interface and a tree interface and so on, and map those onto like Android widgets and onto GWT widgets, and that would work. Um, we kind of hope actually by making it open source, people might do those sort of things, sort of build things on top. Um, actually, one of the other things is that there are people in the audience who are experts on like asset pipelines in games. One of the things we actually need is, is um, four place asset management is very basic, and for importing things like SVG or Collada models and things like that in meshes, it would be cool if people sort of built tools to sort of assist in that part, tying into the rest of the art pipeline. There you go. Thank you. Hi again. Uh, we just tried uh, to enter uh, the Chrome Angry Birds, uh -huh. and it asked for Flash. It's it compiling Flash. No, no, it's not. Um, but what it is doing is, is that if you, um, it's using it for audio to play sounds. So we originally were using the built-in HTML5 audio tag to play audio, but we ran into some hiccups at the last minute, and I believe those are being fixed in newer versions of the browser. But in order to make sure that the game was smooth and, had, and basically was as bug-free as possible, we, we used Flash for the audio for now. But so that's not a sort of a, a knock against HTML5 audio. It's just that there were some problems, and we wanted to make sure that the game ran perfectly. So for multiple platforms, how do you handle like in-app purchases and uh, advertising? So there's callouts into the browser. Um, like I said, for instance, in in uh, Angry Birds, what Rovio did was uh, when you click, I think, some of the buttons in the game um, that you're basically calling out into the browser. You do the same thing for the for your in-app payments or whatever. Um, in terms of architecting it, you basically, you're, you have several entry points for each platform that I showed, those small snippets. Um, you can basically stick that kind of code in, into the platform-specific entry point and call into it in that, in that manner. But to be more specific, there's no high-level service provider API in there for that, but that would be a nice thing to add in like the beta version 
uh, so that like you know, if you're on an Android app, it uses the Android in-app purchase, and if you're on Chrome, it does that. So that's a great idea. And actually, so anybody who doesn't want to contribute code, you can actually just go to the issue tracker and put in what you want, and you know maybe somebody will pick it up. I think that's it. No more questions. So we're letting you guys go home early today. You can get out and play with your play some more with your tablets. <laughs> Thanks for Thanks. coming and th to Blue IO and uh, go forth and make kick-ass games. <laughs>